think about what the Lord has done for me just in this week alone. When I think about the God that was there for me on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday, the God that was with me on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, that when I get up on Sunday morning and put my clothes on, I come with the intention to give the Lord the greatest praise that I have. It's nice to see you. I'm glad that you're here too. But when I walk in the door, I come to give God praise on Sunday morning. Anybody feel like me? Come on, let's go listen to Praise is another day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As I always say that the Lord has done it again. He has given us another day which we have never ever seen. And because of this gift that only He can give, we ought to give Him the highest of praise. Hallelujah. I give you greetings this morning from the A Street Church here in Griffin, Georgia. And I am the pastor of this particular great worship facility. And I'm here, to, I'm here to tell you that we ought to not only give God praise, but we ought to be thankful that he has given us a reasonable health of strength, a sound mind, and the activity of our limbs. For that God is still worthy, the Lord is still worthy, to be praised. We ought to have a testimony within our own lives that can't nobody do us like the Lord. He's done great and marvelous things in my life and he keeps on doing those great and marvelous things. And so I am so graciously humble that he would allow me to come before you once again. Before we get started, I just want you to go and grab your friends, grab family, friends, neighbors, constituents, co-workers, whomever that you need to gather. Tell them to join this particular broadcast virtually here at the A Street Church midweek on a wonderful Wednesday so that 
they can be blessed with the word of God. My, 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 my. Let me say this before we get started. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And what I mean by that is that we are getting ready to re-enter the church so that we can do in-person worship. And I don't know about you, but I am excited, I am elated to get back into church and to worship in person so that I can see you face to face. Many of you I have not seen in quite some time. And we're going to have to renew our relationship because it's been that while. But nevertheless, um, the dates that we're looking at is the second Sunday here in March. Uh, we are preparing a, to host you. We're still uh, asking that you, as a person, as a worshiper, that you will wear your mask, that you will honor social distancing. And as we prepare to move in, we want to be able to create a safe environment where that you can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So I'm just excited. I'm just elated. Amen. To what the future has to hold. And I'm just glad that my future is not in the hands of man, but it is certainly in the hands of the Lord. How are you doing today? It is my prayer that you're doing swell, that you're doing fine. Amen. I want to uh, revisit a subject. And that subject matter suggests what well, it is about hope. It is about hope. And the reason why I want to revisit it is because I think that from a political standpoint, um, you see that we are on the verge of another war, possibly World War III. The conflict that's going on in Europe, and in particular Russia and Ukraine. Um, if you notice that our troops was just brought home by the president, President Biden. And now they are getting ready to deploy again. This thing, war, mm, called war, has caused um, devastation to our families personally, whether it be black or white, Hispanic or Asian. Nothing comes out of war good. So I want you to be in prayer for the soldiers, be in prayer for the leadership of the soldiers, and also be in prayer for the families of the soldiers. And be in prayer of those who are victims, those who are civilians of this particular war and conflict as well. So it is my hope that that the Lord will see us through uh, this particular conflict unscathed. So let's go to First Peter chapter five. And while I was speaking of an international way of hope, hope also filters down not only from an international and a national level. But it filters down to a personal level. Perhaps life is, is conflicting with you. Perhaps you have some things that you're dealing with. It can be anything from a personal conflict, financial conflict, faith conflict. It can be relational it can be emotional. It can even be spiritual. And sometimes we get so frustrated in the things that we're going through that our hope is no longer full. But our hope keeps us barely holding on. And we sit here and we wait for a better day. Nothing's wrong with that because better days is something that we want to behold. 
So our lesson for today's question or subject matter is First Peter chapter 5. Allow me to read what thus says the Lord. First Peter chapter 5 verse 5 says this. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. And yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. So be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So resist him, set fast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So may the God of all grace, who called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered for a while perfect establish strengthen and settle you to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever amen so I think that if you ask me about hope I will simply make this statement and I'm going to use it as a subject. My hope is in Christ. My hope, some would say that my hope is built in Christ. Because we have been given eternal life, we have hope. The trials in this life, we can rest assured that one day that we will have what? Eternal joy, peace, and pain. Correction, where pain, shall I say? And the tears will never reach us. So when we compare our eternal inheritance that awaits for every believer, the sufferings that we endure here on earth they are but for a fleeting moment so Peter writes this particular text to help us as believers um, to look back and view our struggles for what they are which simply suggests that the strugglings that we share in the suffering of Christ they give us the endurance to be faithful and it also enables us to rejoice in a resurrected state and what I mean by resurrected state is that we once was down but we're not out I've fallen but I can get up I can law, I can lose, but I haven't lost the game. I'm still in the game. I still have an opportunity. I may have failed, but I still have opportunities. My hope will not allow me to die. Will not allow my enemies to Continue to not only get the best of me, but to abuse me or to bully me. My hope is in Christ and the sufferings that I experience in this world. Amen. Gives me the strength that I can get up and continue to run the race that is set before me. I can continue to do the things 
that which are impossible in the eyes of others and also may be impossible in the eyes of myself but my hope says that all things are possible to those who believe so it is through the experiences that I have I still can rejoice because I know that it's only temporary by it being temporary hey I know that I'm going to be able to have the V-I-C-T-O-R-Y and that's the victory I may not have it today I may not have it tomorrow but my true victory is just over the horizon it's just over the hill and I heard the psalmist says because I'm searching for victory I'm going to look towards the hills which cometh my help the hills does not give me the help that I need but the hill is a directional it's a sign it helps me amen when I'm lost it helps me to look in a direction that I need to look and that I need to travel the hills serves as a sign of the direction that I need to go are you hearing what I'm saying so therefore my hope mm -hmm, is in Christ and when I lose my way and sometimes I do because the frustrations of life because of the failures that I have or because of the, of the enemies that I must face whether they be internal or external the hill serves as the direction that I need to go I look towards the hills where, for whence all of my help comes from the hills once again the hills does not give me the help but it points me in the direction of the Lord. We all need hills within our lives. Because sometimes as we travel through the barren deserts of life, we have the propensity to make the wrong turn because our navigation can be off. But the hill, Lord have mercy, the hills lets us know which direction that we need to go, which direction that we need to turn. It serves as a pointer or a sign. That's what the Word of God is. It is a sign of the direction that I need to go. So as I talk about hope, there's three things that I want to share with you Then I'm finished with this thought of mine. Amen. Because my the first thing is is that my hope is in Christ. Because listen, God will exalt me when I'm humble. Lord have mercy. God will exalt me or God will lift me when I am humble. God will bless me when I'm humble. God will strengthen me when I'm humble. God will give me knowledge wisdom when I'm humble so the key thing is that if you want God's uh, hand on your life be humble I mean that's that's found right there in verse number five and seven that we read you know God amen exalts those who are humble and that exaltation does not mean that necessarily that he puts you above other people but it does mean that he puts me beyond or above my problems and sometimes the exaltation is not necessarily putting you above your problems but it puts you uh, or better it gives you the ability to endure your problems it doesn't necessarily take you out of the fiery furnace but it gives you the strength to survive 
the fiery furnace. God exalts those who are humble. Does not mean that he's going to take you out of the lion's den. But he will give you a good night's sleep. Mm. While in the lion's den. God exalts those who are humble. And the key word, two things, is that God, first of all, God has the ability. That's number one. And, but then number two is that God has um, uh, the ability, amen, to change your situation. God exalts those who are humble. So the key word is humility. Humility, not to walk around, amen, with your head bowed and you are afraid to look up. No, it simply means that you have a high regard or a top shelf level of respect for God. Part of our problems these days and throughout the Bible it teaches is that some kind of way man mm, he's inconsistent when it comes to the respect that he has for God. When, when things are bad uh, he has a high level or high regard for God in terms of respect but when things are going well he does not consider or regard God with respect because things are not things are not bad in his life he's not in a bad situation but he's in a situation listen where everything is good so there's no need according to the mindset of man to give God the respect that he deserves but the scripture says it doesn't matter whether you are up or down or whether you are in a place of goodness or in a place of badness it does not matter if you're in a good place or a bad place or if you're in a place of holiness or a place of horror you need to have a top shelf level mentality when it comes to having respect for God. When Moses was on the backside of the mountain and he saw the burning bush and he went to investigate. What caught Moses' attention, not that it was a burning bush because that's a common theme. But what caught Moses' attention is that the bush was burning, but it was not being consumed. So that is his calling towards the bush. That was his calling call. That is really what caught Moses' attention to the degree that he went to investigate the bush. And when he approached it, amen. The bush began to speak, thus declaring, Moses, pull off your shoes because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. The bush was not to be consumed, was not being consumed. Not that it was burning, but it was not being burnt up. Lord have mercy. And only God can do that. Man can set bushes on fire anytime. But yet can he set a bush on fire and that bush would not be consumed? Only God can do that. So the key to having God's blessings is humility. It's humility that if you want the best of God then you got to clothe yourself in humility even mankind has an affinity for those who are humble are you hearing what I'm saying one of the key traits of my pastor who was pastor R.L. Hodo and he's been pastoring for like 50 years we want to send a shout out unto him. But one of the key identifiers of his ministry and his personality is that of humility. 
that of humility. And because that he is an humble person, he gathers the respect of the people and he gathers the favor of God. So it doesn't matter to what degree that you've messed up, to how you fail. It doesn't matter, amen, uh, how low that you've sunk or how far you have strayed away. If you are willing to practice humility, God will show you his favor, his rewards. God will see you through whatever that you are experiencing. All because he exalts those, he lifts those, he blesses those who are humble. That's what Peter says. Peter, when you look at the life of Peter, Peter was anything but humble. As a matter of fact, and then when the Lord took him up to the mountain of transfiguration, you no, know, Moses, I mean, Moses and Elijah. All of them assembled together to speak to the Lord, to minister unto him. And it was Peter's idea that we should, um, of course, Elijah as well. Uh, Peter had the idea to make three tabernacles. Instead of considering the order of God he had within his mind and he thought that he was doing a good thing to make three tabernacles and that particular mindset was an error on another event when the Lord was washing the feet there of the disciples in order to teach the disciples a servant's lesson or the lesson of a servant or the heart of a servant it was Peter who declared that, hey listen now you don't have to wash my feet and then the Lord's response was well Peter if I can't wash your feet you can have no part of the kingdom Peter's response was well, Lord wash me all over because I want to be a part but it was Peter's lack of humility Mm, mm, mm. There was another uh, particular event that took place that when uh, Jesus was giving the disciples a discourse and he was telling them that he had to leave for that it was expedient that he would leave so that they could receive the gift. Peter's response, Lord, you don't have to leave. And the Lord's response was, get behind me, Satan. It was Peter's arrogance in those particular events that the God had to um, abase him so that he can be lifted up at the appointed time. And the appointed time was when Pentecost came. The Lord have mercy, Max chapter 2. And when they was gathering around in order to take the census, it was those people who declared, there were some people who declared that these, after the Holy Ghost has fell at them and they began to speak in unknown tongues, the people began to suggest that, hey, that these people are drunk. Here's the exaltation. Peter stood up that these people are not drunk as you suppose to think, as you supposedly think. But yet, this is already prophesied. And the prophet of Joel, that my spirit shall be poured out. Don't you see how Peter was exalted when he humbled himself? Let me ask you something. When is the last time that you've humbled yourself before the Lord? Because sometimes humility, listen now, 
it's not a an event but it's a lifestyle you can't humble yourself today or at the moment and then expect for God to exalt you in a in a lifetime it becomes a way of life and and the challenge is is that not that we can't humble ourselves the challenge lies within the point of our pride our pride our pride will allow us to be the best that we can be for ourselves but our pride prevents us from being the best that we can be for him did you hear what I just said our pride amen <clears throat> it, it helps us to be the best for ourselves individually but spiritually for God it prevents us because you want to know what uh, we are worried about what other people are saying we're worried about what other people are doing we're worried about what other people, how other people are living. We're constantly comparing ourselves. But when you're humble, you don't compare yourselves to nobody but yourself. It's a self-examination. <laughs> Lord have mercy. It's the examination of self. So God exalts us when we're humble. But not only does he exalt us when we are humble but then secondly is that we can stand firmly or we can stand our ground listen when we resist the devil we can stand firmly when we resist the devil verses 8 through 9 helps us to understand listen that we can stand during our suffering when we resist the devil in other words hey I can I can fall down in the mud but I can stand up in the mud puddle wipe myself off and still continue forward it may not be pretty but pretty is not the criteria here Sometimes we put the wrong pressure on us or better yet, we put pressure on us because we have the wrong criteria. We have the wrong requirements of ourselves. God never asked you to be pretty. He asked you to be faithful. God never asked you to be pretty. He asked you to be humble. God never asked you to be cute. He asked you to stand. He never asked you to look good. I heard Solomon say that vanity is temporary. And we go through life, Lord have mercy, looking for that which is good, looking for that which is beauty. I mean, look at the fashion industry. <laughs> We're trying to buy Gucci, Louis Vuitton, uh, uh, Tory Burch, Prada, you know, Nike, Adidas. We're trying to brand, uh, we're trying to wear name brands in order to exalt self. But it's not the criteria with God. That's not, fashion is not a criteria with God. It's not a requirement. It's not a requirement. But yet we pursue those things because we want to look good. Looking good is not a requirement. The requirement is that we would be humble. We can resist Satan. Now, I can remember 
those times in college when I didn't pay attention or I, I didn't do my homework or maybe a combination of both. So I had to do an all night cram session trying to cram four to six weeks worth of work into one night into my head into my mind I won't use my head because my head is kind of large but my mind four weeks of school work six weeks of school work in my mind in one night it isn't that it could not have been done but the fact is is that listen is that one did not have the endurance to do that all night so what that simply meant I didn't have the time to cram or enough time but also didn't have the capacity we can stand in our suffering when we have the capacity when we have the time and when we stand within our capacity when we have the time we have the ability to resist the devil. Mm, mm, mm. In other words, when I say that when we have the time, when we do not have the ability, that means that we can stay alert. We are conscious, we are aware, we know the characteristics there of the enemy. Because the enemy's motives, his goals, has not changed since the scripture was given unto us and before. What is his motive? To steal, kill, and destroy. When we have the time, we can defend. But when we don't have the time... Mm, we do not have the capacity. And so therefore, when we fail to prepare, we underestimate the enemy. But when you know his motives, his motives does not change regardless of the temperature of the day, regardless of the weather of the day, regardless of of the forecast of the week his motives are still the same to steal kill and destroy in other words he's there to do you harm and if he can he will try to um, achieve that goal with a uh, with the least resources that he can use. Why call in a legion of demons when you're self-destructing? Why continue to stay up all night planning how to defeat you when you're self-destructing? He continues to feed in our self-destructive mindset. Least energy that he has to use. But listen to what he says now. Is that he's like a roaring lion. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. That 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 he's using the identity of a lion he roars he's strong he's loud he's proud 
and he knows how to kill. He sets himself up. He prepares to kill. And that's what the enemy is doing to each and every one of us. And when he attacks, he does not attack that which is strong, but that which is weak. That's an easy kill. So therefore, when we do not prepare for warfare, when we do not prepare our minds, our hearts, when we're trying to cram six weeks worth of lesson into a couple of hours at that night. Not only is it tasking mentally, but it's tasking emotionally and physically because we can't stay up all night. As one would say, you got to know your limits. You got to know what you want to do. So, those who are prepared, you can resist the devil and the devil will flee, but only for a moment. Now he understands that I got to use more resources in order to get at you. Re I got to rethink this thing. I got to have more strategy. I got to use, I got to deploy additional uh, resources and weaponry because I am prepared to resist him so in my suffering <laughs> I'm standing firm on God's word in my suffering I'm still preparing myself to deal with the worst because I know that he's preparing me. And while I'm suffering, I still can resist the devil because his motives is to steal, kill, and destroy. Think about those th three things. I wish I had time to indulge into that. Those three subjects. Kill, steal, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. He's trying to take away something. If he can't take it away, he'll try to kill you so that you can't use it. If he can't kill you, if he can't take it away, he'll try to destroy you. Which means that even if he does take it away from you, that he'll try to destroy you so that you cannot be restored or that you cannot be renewed. It's destroyed. It's no good for usage. Ooh, I wish I had time to deal with those three particulars. So, we've talked about, listen, our, my hope in Christ, listen now, it uh, is my hope allows me to be exalted by God because I'm humble. Secondly, it allows me to stand in my suffering so that I can resist Satan. But then lastly, hey, my hope in Christ, it, mm, how can I put this? Um, my hope in Christ, amen, because I have hope in Christ, God will restore me after I've suffered. God will restore me after I have suffered. A couple of things that I could pull from that because verses 5, correction, verses 10 through 11 helps me to understand that God will restore me after I have suffered. Those three elements, those three motives of the devil, steal, kill, and destroy. God says that even if Satan has gotten the best of you, I will restore you if you walk in humility. You can bounce back 
if you walk in humility after you've suffered, after you've taken your L, after you've gone through life to the degree I've no people now who wants to give up, give up in there, give up on life to literally want to commit suicide because they've said that now my life means nothing. I have nothing to live for. In the midst of their suffering, because Satan has done the thing or he has accomplished the goal in their lives, and in their lives, he still his goal is to still kill and destroy. But when you read chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, it lets us know that your hope amen will allow you to be restored by God after you suffer so therefore after my suffering can I say this it, it is as if that I have a trophy for my suffering it is that you know I have in, in, in the military you have uh, war campaign honors that is put on your chest and on your sleeves they're put there because you've gone through something you have accomplished something by going through something God has restored me after I have suffered why? because I was humble and when I was in my suffering I didn't give up on him but I allowed him to work on me. I kept the faith. And now that I've suffered for a while. Now he's ready to restore me. In other words I got a war story. The scars that I have. The bruise that I have. The broken bones that I've had. God has restored me. And those scars. Is my testimony. I could have been dead, should have been dead, sleeping in my grave. But God, mm, Lord have mercy. You know, in sports, in these sports, uh, you have what is called uh, participation trophies. Trophies that are given not only to the stars or the elite athletes but is given to those athletes that are sitting on the bench I got both <laughs> when I was a star a little boy I got the star trophy but also when I couldn't get on the playing field I got a participation trophy and here's what God is saying yeah, that you don't have to be a superstar, but if you're just on the team, you'll get your trophy. And when you got your trophy, or when you get your trophy, you have a story that you can tell. Even on a championship team, you have players that have won the championship, but then you have those which are on the bench which did not contribute anything although they did not contribute they still get a ring because they were on the team and this is what God is saying that when you're on my team mm, you're going to get a ring you're going to get a trophy but for those of you mm, who suffer I'm going to restore you are you hearing what I'm saying so, so, so now, after you've been restored, you have a testimony. You, you are somebody, you are somebody, you are somebody that God can use. You know, as I studied the Old Testament, Amen. Those persons who was most effective for God, those were the people or the persons 
who have been through something. They have been through something. Heartaches, heartbreaks. Been through something. Confused. Walked in error. Fallen down. Sin. They've been through something. It was not always peaches and cream every day. They've been through something. And now that you're going through something. God will exalt you in due time. God will restore you after you have suffered. Here's the problem. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to go through nothing. And when you don't go through nothing, and when problems come, you faint. There's no strength. There's no power. There's no anchor. I ain't making this up. It's in the scriptures as well as life. If you walk in experience and you will allow experience to be your teacher, you'll find out that you're a better person because you went through something. I went through that divorce. I'm a better person. I went through betrayal. You're a better person. I failed. I failed. I'm a better person. I made that mistake. I've been bankrupt. I've been fired. I've been through, amen, uh, sickness, cancer. I've been falsely accused. I, I've, I've been in prison. I've been in jail. I've been through something. And now that I've been through something, listen, after you have suffered for a while, God will restore you. Some have said, well, and I'm getting ready to close. The things that we've been through when it comes to suffering, it must be God-related. In other words, if you've done something and you're suffering, is it based on God or is it based on selfish deed? Selfish deed. Is it on selfish deed? But I'm here to tell you, it is how you take that experience and you use it for the good of those. This is what the scripture says in Romans chapter 8. All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and that are called according to his purpose. When you've been through something, whether it's self-induced or whether it's induced by other people, can you still give him glory? Can you still walk in humility? Because if you can, he will exalt you in due time. He will restore you. But if you can't, is it because your pride? won't let you do it. One of the greatest peoples that I admire, people that I admire the most, and just recently this just happened, people who have been falsely accused, put in prison, for an X amount of time. And then, after half of their life is gone, if not more, they can get out of the jail cell after being retried and new evidence is formed or DNA is used or a confession comes up only to find out that that person who served in jail for 30, 40, 50 years 
that they walk out of the prison with a smile in their face, on their face, with joy in their heart. No retribution for those who are falsely accused. I have great admiration for those people or those persons. They would tell you, I'm just glad to be out of prison. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, that touches me to another level that I don't, I don't know if I could do or if I have that capacity. But one thing I do know, according to chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, that after we have suffered, God will restore us. And that's the hope in Christ that I have. Because God exalts us when we walk in humility. Secondly, we can stand firmly when we resist the devil. But then God will restore us thoroughly after we have suffered for a little while. Wow. My hope is in Christ. Where's your hope? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And everything else is just sinking sand. Whew. May God bless you. May God keep you on that particular lesson. Listen, before we give benediction, um, I want to be able to share a few announcements with you. And I ask that you would just govern yourselves accordingly. Um, those of you who need to pick up your contribution statements, uh, you can get them in two ways. Number one, you can email the church 408finance at gmail.com or you can pick them up at the church on Sundays between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. For those of you, secondly, for those of you who have children who are graduating this year from high school or from a college, um, but yet, uh, let me start back over. For those of you who have children who are graduating high school, and they're wanting to go to college, amen, uh, you can uh, apply for a scholarship from the Cane Creek Association. Um, what needs to happen is that those of you who are members of the church, uh, you need to pick up a graduating packet, amen, and there's two ways that you can pick those up by email. Email is ESBC, 408 at bellsouth.net or you can come by the church between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And the deadlines for completing those packets and to turn in those packets are on Sunday, March the 13th. Sunday, March the 13th, if I'm not mistaken. Amen. I think that's the same day that we uh, re enter, that we re enter the church. Yes, it is. Yes, so March 13th, okay, which brings me to this, is that on March the 13th, we plan to re-enter the church for in-person worship. We plan to re-enter the church for in-person worship. Now, here's what I need from you as members, the number one is that I need for you to wear masks. Number two, if you are sick, if you're coughing, like I was the other day, but that was from sinuses, but it doesn't matter. If you are sick, if you have a temperature, please stay at home. Please stay at home. Wear your mask on a social distance and let us have a good time in the name of the Lord. Can we do that? I believe that we can. We can do exceedingly and abundantly. Well, I'll see you on this coming Sunday. 
But in the meantime, may God bless you. May God keep you. So let us receive benediction. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you his peace, his peace, his peace. Amen.